perform anesthesias, anesthesia for post-anesthesia care nurses. This is a seven video series on the basics of pharmacology and anesthesia techniques for the peri-anesthesia care nurse. We a group of five outstanding senior students from the University of South Carolina School of Medicine Nurse Anesthesia Program and one CRNA have created this series in the hope it will help the transition into the peri-anesthesia world. The series attempts to shine a bit of light on the techniques anesthesia uses during surgery, as well as explain the basics of the pharmacology behind our drug uses. This is by no means a series that will explain everything that happens during anesthesia, but our hope is that you, the peri-anesthesia nurse, will find our report a little less intimidating and a little more informative. After all, the better you understand the report, the better you can take care of the patient. And ultimately, this will increase the safety and satisfaction for both your patient and yourself. The group consists of Alexandra Horman, BSN RN, CCRN, Braden Seidler, BSN RN, Jordan Coleman, BSN RN, CCRN, Kelsey Squires, BSN RN, CCRN, Victoria Koch, BSN RN, and Michael Storm, DNAP, CRNA, CCRN. The videos can be watched separately, but there are some references among the videos and the basics of the pharmacology along the way. Therefore, it may be beneficial to watch the series in order. Either way, have fun and don't forget to download the accompanying handouts. These handouts are the complete transcripts of the narrations and include all relevant pictures from the videos. This video series is sponsored by Storm Anesthesia and Palmetto Health Richland Anesthesia Department. Enjoy and let's get started. This lecture, which covers inhalation anesthesia, is the second in the seventh lecture series for PACU nurses and is presented by Michael Storm. The objectives of this lecture are to review keywords and definitions, review basic concepts of anesthesia, review pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of inhaled anesthetics, review potency of inhaled anesthetics, review volatile agents, also known as inhaled or inhalational anesthetic gases, and review effects of volatile anesthetics in PACU. At the end of the lecture, you should have an enhanced understanding of goals of anesthesia, what is monitored anesthesia care versus general anesthesia, stages of anesthesia, induction and emergence, volatile anesthetic agents, and important key points for the PACU nurse. Adjustable pressure relief or limiting valve used for release of excessive gas on a circle system of an anesthesia machine. Amnesia, a component of anesthesia in which the patient is unable to recall the event that occurred during the administration of the inhalation anesthetic. Analgesia, a component of anesthesia in which the patient is unable to experience pain. CO2 absorption canister, located in a circle system on an anesthesia machine that clears rebreathed gas containing carbon dioxide by passing through a canister holding a chemical carbon dioxide absorbent. Delirium, an acute onset of variable and fluctuating changes in level of consciousness accompanied by a range of other mental symptoms. Diffusion hypoxia, refers to the rapid exit of nitrous oxide and thus partial reduction of the percentage of oxygen that can be inhaled during the immediate emergence phase of recovery from anesthesia. Supplemental oxygen is recommended the first five to 10 minutes after emergence to avoid this phenomenon. Effective dose. The dose of a drug necessary to produce a certain effect in a certain percentage of patients. For example, the ED50 is the term for when a drug produces a particular effect in 50% of patients. Hypnosis, a component of anesthesia in which the patient becomes unconscious. Inhalation anesthesia, anesthetic substances in either volatile or gaseous form that are inhaled via an anesthesia machine circuit. 
lacrimation. Tears from the lacrimal glands on the medial side of the tissue surrounding the eyes. Minimal alveolar concentration, or MAC. A measure of potency of inhalation anesthetic agents occurs when the equilibrium in tidal anesthetic concentrations expressed as a fraction of one atmosphere prevent movement in response to surgical skin incision in 50% of human subjects. Muscle relaxation, a component of anesthesia in which the patient has reduced tension of the skeletal muscle. Nociception, the perception of a painful or injurious stimulus. Scavenger system, used to reduce exposure to escaping gases from the anesthesia machine. A waste gas suction tube, scavenger, is connected to the anesthesia machine and the gases are then vented to the outside atmosphere via an operating room suction system. Solubility coefficient. The ratio of the concentration of an anesthetic in blood or other tissue to that in a gas phase when the two are in equilibrium. Sympatholysis. A component of anesthesia in which the patient is blocked from having an autonomic response to nociceptive painful stimuli. Vaporizer. A device on the anesthesia machine that converts liquid anesthetics into metered amount of vapor that are added to the fresh gas mixture to produce a known concentration of the vaporized form of the inhalational anesthetic agent. The goals of anesthesia is to create a supportive environment for the surgeon, which includes hypnosis or consciousness, analgesia, immobility or muscle relaxation, amnesia, and perhaps sympatholysis, which is attenuation of autonomic response to noxious stimuli. These goals may need to be obtained either fully or sometimes just partially. We do not always place patients under general anesthesia. Often less is more and monitored anesthesia care or MAC, which can be just light sedation, may be all that is needed. General anesthesia or GA is when the patient is fully asleep and will not react to surgical stimulation. They will not have any awareness of what is going on around them and they will not feel any pain. GETA, or general endotracheal anesthesia, is the same as GA with the slight difference of using endotracheal tube for intubation. Monitored anesthesia care, or MAC, covers a wide range of sedation techniques from light sedation to general anesthesia. The term MAC can easily be confused with the inhalational gas term minimum alveolar concentration, which is also called MAC, but they are not the same. Monitored anesthesia care is an anesthetic technique, whereas minimum alveolar concentration is a measure of anesthetic depth. Minimum alveolar concentration is the amount of inhalational agent or gas that is necessary to ensure that 50% of patients will not move when the surgeon cuts the skin. This makes minimum alveolar concentration a measure of anesthetic depth. There are several factors that may influence MAC. Factors that will decrease MAC and therefore will require less inhalational gas include advanced age, which for this is more than 40, metabolic acidosis, hypoxia or saturation is less than 70%, hypotension, decreased CNS neurotransmitter levels, acute alcohol or marijuana, pregnancy, opioids, ketamine, diazepam or lithium, anemia, hypothermia or hyponatremia. Some factors will increase MAC and hence will require more gas and they include young age, again for this will be less than one year, hyperthermia, hypernatremia, chronic alcohol abuse or an increase in CNS neurotransmitter levels. Also many factors do nothing to MAC and a short list include anesthetic duration, potassium levels, anesthetic metabolism, thyroid conditions, gender, or species, which is human, dogs, pigs, etc. Anesthesia is not an on-off button. We don't have the ability to create full anesthetic depth instantly, but we see anesthesia as a continuum from awake and conscious to fully asleep and unconscious. 
we tailor the level of anesthesia dependent on the need for the surgery and the individual surgeon preference, all in light on what is safe for the individual patient. The depth of anesthesia goes from minimal sedation, where the patient can respond to verbal command, have patent airway with spontaneous breathing, and cardiac functions are unaffected. A little deeper, we call moderate sedation. Now the patient will respond purposefully to verbal commands with or without tactile stimulation. They have adequate airway, respiratory, and cardiac functions. During deep sedation, the patient will not easily be aroused, but will respond purposefully to repeated or painful stimuli. They may require airway support and respiration may be inadequate. Cardiac function is usually maintained. During general anesthesia, the patient is not arousable even by painful stimuli. They often, but not always, require airway assistance by as little as chin lift to possibly positive pressure ventilation. Cardiac function may be impaired. The difference from one level to the next is very fluid and can happen without notice, which is why it is not recommended that non-anesthesia personnel attempt moderate sedation. If the patient suddenly drifts deeper into deep sedation, respiratory function could be impaired and beyond the capability of a non-anesthesia trained person. We categorize anesthesia in different stages from one through four. The transit through the stages is facilitated by drugs or gases administered by the anesthetist. Stage one is also called the awake stage. During stage one, the patient remains conscious but has no memory of what happens and will not experience pain. The patient can follow simple commands but will not remember this. Most importantly, protective reflexes, for example gag reflex, are intact. This is the level the patient often experiences going back to the room after Versed and fentanyl administered in the holding area. Physiologically, we note normal breathing, open eyes to command, maintain protective reflexes, for example, gag reflex, or may tolerate painful procedures, for example, IV starts. Stage two is called stage of delirium. Stage two is a delirium stage where the patient will have dreams. The patient experiences loss of eyelid reflex and the respiration becomes irregular, but still effective for the most part. Stage two passes quickly, but it's very important to recognize since in this stage, the vocal cords are very susceptible to muscle spasm, thereby causing laryngospasm. It is important to recognize that the patients will experience stage two during both induction and emergence. Physiologically, we note excitement, irregular respiration, risk of vomiting, and risk of laryngospasm. Stage three, or the stage of surgical anesthesia. This stage is divided into four planes, each representing a deeper anesthetic level than the previous. We look for certain physiologic parameters to identify these planes. First plane, you will see regular respiration, normal pupils, swallow, retching, and vomiting reflexes disappear and come back in reverse order during emergence. Second plane, regular respiration, but shallow, cease muscle movements, laryngospasm reflex fully disappears. Third plane, decreasing intercostal respiration and onset of diaphragmatic respiration. Fourth plane, irregular respiration, maximally dilated pupils, respiration is now diaphragmatic and eventually will stop. Most surgeries take place in during stage three. There is an absence of eyeless response, blink and swallowing reflex. This is also the stage in which we intubate the patient. Most general surgeries are performed in stage three, third plane, where the surgeon have optimal conditions to perform the procedure. A decreased depth of anesthesia can be useful, depending on how quickly we want the patient to wake up. Some procedures may require wake up during the procedure to check neurological status. Breathing is controlled either by the ventilator or by spontaneous breathing. If a ventilator is used, we keep the arterial partial pressure of CO2 low, around 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury or low normal, to suppress the patient's own drive to breathe. 
When breathing spontaneously, the arterial partial pressure of CO2 is often elevated due to respiratory depression from narcotic or the volatile agent. Stage 4 or the overdose stage. Stage 4 is very deep anesthesia and not needed for surgery, mostly considered an overdose. You may see respiratory and cardiovascular collapse. Despite this, stage 4 is often seen during pediatric inhalational induction and must then be addressed aggressively to avert disaster. Treatment with an anticholinergic, for example atropine, and decrease in gas concentration as well as supporting blood pressure and ventilation may be necessary. There are several parameters we use to determine the depth of anesthesia apart from what we can read off our monitors. Among the more sensitive are breathing and the eyes. Breathing is the most sensitive parameter. Breathing is under autonomic control, which makes it so sensitive to anesthesia. When the patient uses diaphragmatic muscles without the intercostals, we can reliably determine the patient is somewhere in stage 3 or surgical stage. In PACU, this should not be the case, but hopefully a lighter level of anesthesia may be observed with a more regular breathing pattern, the rhythm, and depth. These are signs to look for, though, when emerging the patients from a ventilator in PACU. Eye movement indicate light anesthesia, and when the eyes become divergent, each eye looking outwards, the patient is in stage two. During induction, eventually the eyes become cross-eyed which indicates stage three. Lacrimation happens during light anesthesia and is often a sign of pending emergence. Another factor looked at is muscle tone and less tone equals deeper anesthesia. No single parameter should be used alone, but rather taken as part of a whole in the assessment of the patient. Constant vigilance is the name of the game. The goal for the anesthetist is to maintain a constant and optimal concentration of gas in the brain. We do this by adjusting the delivery of gas from the vaporizer. We can only have a single gas vaporizer on at any given time. It is not possible to combine volatile agents. Optimally, the partial pressures in the alveoli, the arteries, and the brain equalizes. This takes time and does not happen immediately. Consider the gas flow starting at the anesthesia machine. The first stop is in the alveoli. When we perform an inhalational induction, when the patient breathes themselves to sleep, the following are important parameters. Increasing the overall flow, called fresh gas flow, and the delivered gas concentration will speed up the onset of anesthesia by building up the partial pressure of gas in the alveoli faster. A higher minute ventilation by the patient will increase the speed of induction as well. Interestingly, physics dictates that higher concentrations of the delivered gas will cause a relatively even higher concentration of gas in the alveoli. This is called the concentration effect and will speed up induction. The anesthesia machine uses non-absorbable part, so gas does not adhere to machine parts. Next step is to bring the gas into the blood system, the arterial blood. Some physical properties of the gas determines how fast and how much of the gas is exchanged between the alveoli and the arteries. The blood gas coefficient, also called the Oswald solubility coefficient, is important. The more soluble a gas is, the more will be absorbed in the blood. Isoforane is more soluble than desferrine so more isoflurane is absorbed in blood than for desferrane. But there is a slight hiccup with a high solubility. High solubility results in a slow induction. In other words, it takes longer for the patient to fall asleep. This is because the gas tends to stay in the blood and is not willing to pass on to the brain tissue, which is where we want it to go. Also, the cardiac output is important. Low cardiac output results in fast induction, and vice versa, high cardiac output results in slow induction. This is because the buildup of partial pressure in blood happens faster with low cardiac output.
blood is distributed to the different tissues of the body at different speed and volume. Much more blood is going to the vessel-rich group, the VRG, lungs, liver, kidneys, brain, and heart, than to the muscles and fat. As can be seen in the chart, using an average adult person of 70 kg, the vessel-rich group receives 75% of the blood flow, and this group is only 10% of the body mass. The VRG also receives a much faster blood flow than any other group. This group, therefore, receives a massive amount of blood compared to any other part of the body. The result is that the brain, being part of the VRG, receiving a large amount of blood, is able to be anesthetized quickly. We talk about a time constant regarding a held anesthetic. Don't worry what it is, but the lower the time constant, the faster a drug can influence a particular tissue. The time constant for the VRG is two to three minutes, compared to 33 minutes for muscle and 2,500 minutes for fat. Clearly, much lower for the VRG. Eventually, during the anesthesia, the other compartments will start to receive and fill up with inhaled gas. If the anesthetic is long enough, the muscle group will saturate, but it is unlikely that the fat tissue will ever be saturated. The more these tissues saturate, the longer it takes to emerge the patient, since these tissues will act as storage units and keep releasing gas long after the concentration in the brain has fallen to acceptable levels for wake up. Interestingly, it requires a lower partial volatile gas pressure in the body to wake up than it does to go to sleep. Consequently, we must plan early for the emergence and try to minimize the gas concentration in the body to allow for a rapid wake up of the patient. Despite this, the patient will still be giving off volatile gas when they arrive to pack you, which you can smell on the patient's breath. Be aware of this when you dose the patient with sedatives or narcotics. We just saw that a massive amount of blood goes to the brain. The brain is obviously the most important organ when we want the patient to go to sleep, induction. The partial pressure of gas in the alveoli is the first to be maximized. Then the blood concentration will start to increase, and finally the concentration in the brain will start to rise. The goal, as stated earlier, is for these three areas to equalize. Partial pressure in the alveoli equal partial pressure in the artery equals partial pressure in the brain. The larger the gradient, the faster the gas will move across the membranes towards equilibration. Therefore, high fresh gas flow and high concentration of gas from the vaporizer is beneficiary for fast inhalational induction. We keep talking about induction. What actually happens why the patient goes to sleep is still a mystery. We don't know why anesthetics work. We are theories, but no confirmation that any of these are correct. One theory is the Meyer-Overton theory. This postulates that gas will dissolve in fatty tissue, of which there is plenty around brain cells. When these fatty tissues saturate, they cause anesthesia. Another theory is a receptor theory. This theory states that there is some kind of anesthesia receptors, for example, GABA or others, that bind the gas and causes anesthesia. We do know that increased lipid solubility of a gas will increase the potency of that gas. The more lipid soluble a gas is, the more potent or stronger it is. Isoferrane, being the most lipid soluble, is the most potent of the volatile agents. So how do we wake up the patient? We call this emergence. Basically, we just turn off the gas and turn up the flow of oxygen. Physiologically, this will create inverse partial pressure gradients where the lowest partial pressure now is in the alveoli and the highest in the brain tissue. When we no longer deliver gas to the lungs, but only oxygen, the partial pressure of gas will become zero in the alveoli. Now the gas in the blood will move out of the blood and into the alveoli for then to be aired out by the next breath. This will cause the partial pressure of gas to fall in the blood 
and hence the gas to flow out of the brain and other tissues and into the blood. The blood will again return to the lungs and the gas will be aired out of the system. Eventually, there will be no more gas left in the brain and the patient will emerge from anesthesia. When emerging a patient from anesthesia, there are several factors that will influence how fast this will occur. Increasing the flow of non-volatile agent, mostly oxygen, will speed up the removal of volatile agent. Increased minute ventilation, respiratory rate multiplied with tidal volume, will also speed up the removal of volatile agent. It is beneficial to have relative larger tidal volume and fewer breaths since this will decrease the movement of dead space. Dead space is the part of airway lung that does not take part of the gas exchange. We can also introduce nitrous oxides towards the end of surgery, since this can replace some of the volatile agent. The very low lipid solubility of nitrous oxide allows this gas to come off the tissues faster than volatile agent. Talking about volatile agents, these have different lipid solubilities and therefore makes a difference which volatile agents we use for our anesthetic. Volatile agent with a lower lipid solubility will come off faster and the patient will thus emerge faster. Desferrin has the lowest solubility followed by sevoforrain and isoforrain in that order. It is also important for the patient to have an adequate core temperature, colder tissues have an increased ability to retain volatile agent, which will slow down emergence. The anesthesia machine is what we use to deliver the volatile agent along with oxygen, air, and or nitrous oxide to the patient. Most commonly used is what we call a semi-closed circuit system. In its most basic form, we can view the anesthesia machine as a device that delivers oxygen, air, or nitrous oxide via a flow meter. This determines how much of each gas is delivered to the patient. The vaporizer is where the volatile agent is stored. The device determines how much volatile agent is introduced into the flow of oxygen, air, or nitrous oxide. The anesthesia machine has a ventilator built in, which we use to ventilate the patient during the majority of a case. This is much easier than to hand ventilate for extended periods of time. The bellow is just a visual of the ventilator working. When the bellow moves up and down, we can see the air going in and out of the lungs. We deliver the gas mix, oxygen, air, nitrous oxide, and or volatile agents to the patient through a corrugated tube system called the circuit. If we don't use the ventilator, we can adjust the resistance to flow by the adjustable pressure limiting or APL valve. This allows us to force more or less air mix into the patient's lungs. The soda lime canister removes the carbon dioxide, CO2, from the flow mix. Remember, carbon dioxide is a waste product of metabolism in the body. Finally, excessive gas is removed from the system by the scavenging system, which is then removed from the OR in the old days these excessive gases were vented into the OR. The next picture shows in slightly more detail how the gases flow through the anesthesia machine. The gases come into the machine at different pressures. The cylinders seen to the left of the red arrow are considered high pressure. The gas passes through pressure regulators that decrease the high oxygen or air pressure up to 2000 PSIG to intermediate pressure around 45 to 50 PSIG. The secondary pressure regulators decrease the gas pressure further to what is considered low pressure around 15 PSIG. The gases, which can be any of the non-volatile aging gases, oxygen, air, and nitrous oxide, can also come from the hospital wall supply. It is then delivered at intermediate pressure. The gas now flows through the flow meters, which allows us to regulate how much we deliver of each gas. Next step is for the gas to flow through the vaporizer and collect the volatile agent we use to anesthetize the patient. Finally, the gas mix is delivered to the patient via the corrugated circuit.
The first anesthetic gas used to anesthetize a patient for surgery was diethyl ether, or just ether for short, in 1842. Nitrous oxide was initially a party gas because it causes a light, giggly mood. It was introduced to anesthesia in 1845. Chloroform was introduced in 1847 and remained popular for many years, although it is very toxic and the risk of death during anesthesia is at least four to five times higher than with either. Cyclopropane was introduced into anesthesia in 1934, and all these gases were highly flammable and could easily explode in the OR. Halothane, introduced into anesthesia in 1856, was the first modern anesthetic volatile agent. Each of these gases had significant side effects and toxicities. The therapeutic index was very low for each of these gases as well, which makes them harder to titrate. The only good gas, although some will dispute this, was nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is not a volatile agent and it does have some side effects. Modern Western anesthesia only uses three volatile agents, isoflurane, desflurane, and sevoflurane. Halothane is widely used in third world countries due to low cost. Volatile agent means easily able to change from liquid to gaseous form. Neither of these agents are flammable nor explosive and each has better therapeutic index than the old gases. The improvement of these volatile agents is due to a change in the molecular structure of the gas. It is now possible to add a halogen or fluoride atom into an ether gas and this will create these new gases. All these gases are liquids at room temperature and sea level atmospheric pressure. The anesthesia vaporizer unit will let this liquid vaporize and we can now introduce the volatile agent in gas form into the circuit that delivers gas to the patient. The vaporizer unit can deliver a precise concentration of volatile agent to the patient. The concentration of volatile agent delivered determines the depth of anesthesia of the patient. All volatile agents have similar effects on the human body systems. The central nervous system will show a dose-dependent depression and decreased oxygen metabolism. There will be an increase in the blood flow, which will cause an increase in the intracranial pressure. The cardiovascular system may develop arrhythmias, ectopy, and increased heart rate. These symptoms are also dose-dependent. In the gastrointestinal system, we will see a relaxation of the smooth muscles and a decrease in muscle activity. All volatile agents cause a dose-dependent depression of the respiratory system, which causes the patient to breathe more shallow and slower. This will create a buildup of carbon dioxide in the body. The volatile agents also dull the ventilatory response to this increased carbon dioxide level. This should be a particular concern for the PACU nurse, since some of the volatile agents will still be coming off when the patient arrives to PACU. On a positive note, all the volatile agents cause bronchodilation. Since sevoflurane is the least irritating of the three agents, it is often used for asthma patients. The blood flow will decrease to the liver and kidneys due to a decrease in the cardiac output. This may lead to a decreased glomerular filtration rate and oliguria, decreased urine output. The surgical insult will also cause an increase in antidiuretic output from the pituitary gland, which will affect the sodium balance and cause fluid retention. Overall, you may see a decreased urinary output as well. There will be a dose-dependent relaxation of the uterus, which may cause increased bleeding during C-section. For a C-section, we therefore prefer regional anesthesia, that is spinal or epidural. Although the modern volatile agents are much safer than the old agents, there are still risks associated with the use of a volatile agent. Most notable is the respiratory depression, which may even cause apnea, especially when a volatile agent is used in conjunction with sedatives and analgesics. There is a dose-dependent cardiac depression, which leads to a decreased cardiac output, bradycardia, and decreased stroke volume. Some patients will, 
when exposed to volatile agent or succinylcholine, have a vicious reaction with severe muscle contraction and a fast rise in body temperature. This is called malignant hyperthermia. Significant complications include rhabdomyolysis, breakdown of muscle cells, and hyperkalemia, high potassium level from muscle cell breakdown. The PACU nurse may note T-colored urine from the rhabdomyolysis and EKG changes from the hyperkalemia. Other symptoms may be noted like increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate caused by increased CO2 production, mixed acidosis noted on APGs, and massive muscle rigidity, jaw muscle stiffness. The rise in body temperature is actually a late sign of malignant hyperthermia. All the volatile agents cause vasodilation, which leads to a redistribution of the blood flow. There will be an increased blood flow to the periphery with an ensuing loss of heat. Additionally, volatile agents have a depressant effect of the hypothalamus, which will disrupt the temperature regulation. This may lead to hypothermia and possible shivering, or if the patient is heated too much, hyperthermia. Shivering is a beneficial reaction by the body when getting cold. Unfortunately, many of our patients are elderly with poor cardiac function and shivering increases oxygen utilization, so this increased workload on the heart may be detrimental and should be avoided. Additionally, shivering is not pleasant for the patient. The operating rooms are notoriously cold, which makes it even harder to keep the patient comfortably warm during surgery. Nitrous oxide is an odorless, sweet-smelling inorganic gas. It is a simple molecular structure, not flammable, but it will support combustion, fire, as well as oxygen will. It does have an analgesic effect and is often used at the dentist's office. It has a very low lipid solubility, which makes for a fast onset offset of anesthesia. It cannot be used as a sole agent though, since its potency is very low. Nitrous oxide has a risk of causing post-operative nausea and vomiting, also called PONV. This is due to a pressure buildup in the inner ear. Due to its high disposability, it can fill closed spaces with excessive amount of nitrous oxide. This can cause pneumocephalus, gas inside the brain, pneumothorax, gas inside the chest, gas in the middle ear, cause of pondy, and gas buildup in the intestines, causing bowel obstruction. Due to its very rapid diffusibility, it can cause diffusion hypoxia after emergence. Let me explain diffusion hypoxia, since this is a situation you may see in PACU, especially if you place the patient on room air to get a baseline. Always check with the anesthesia provider if it is acceptable to not give supplemental oxygen. Diffusion hypoxia can happen after emergence when nitrous oxide has been used at the end of surgery. Due to its very high diffusibility, there will be a rapid washout of nitrous oxide from the blood into the alveoli. When this rapid washout is combined with a low inspired oxygen concentration, for example, room air, or poor ventilation, for example, patient being narcotized, it creates an increased concentration of nitrous oxide in the alveoli, as well as a dilutional decrease in concentration of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the alveoli. The combination of increased nitrous oxide and decreased oxygen concentrations in the alveoli will cause hypoxia and subsequent hypoxemia. The decreased carbon dioxide concentration will result in a decreased ventilatory drive, which in turn will cause poor ventilation and versioning of hypoxia. All in all, a detrimental situation for the patient. The treatment is simple. Supply high inspired concentration of oxygen by leaving them on an oxygen mask for 10 minutes post extubation. After 10 minutes, the nitrous oxide has disappeared from the system. Key point, 
leave the patient on oxygen when anesthesia brings the patient to pack you with oxygen until safe per anesthesia. The oldest of the three modern volatile agents is isoflurane. Iso is a halogenated methyl ethyl ether, meaning it is an ether like the old diethyl ether or just ether, although with halogenated chloride and fluoride atoms attached to the ether bridge, the O-ring in the drawing or the red ball. Iso has a strong, pungent and irritating odor and is therefore not to be used for inhalational induction. This could create breath holding and possible laryngospasm. It is commonly used and is the cheapest of the modern volatile agents on the market. One side effect of isoflurane is its tendency to sensitize the myocardial muscle. If we place a regional block, we should therefore add less than 5 micrograms per patient weight in kilos of epinephrine to the local anesthetic. Isoflurane may also cause coronary steel, although this is rare and mostly not considered an actual concern during anesthesia. Despite this, let me explain coronary steel. When a blood vessel begins to narrow due to buildup of plaque, the blood flow through this vessel will decrease. This can cause ischemia. The body will try to compensate for this decreased flow by vasodilating this narrowed vessel and divert blood flow through collateral vessels. This is meant to increase the blood flow back towards normal. With increased plaque buildup, eventually the body will not be able to compensate for the narrowing effect of the plaque. At this point, the narrow vessels cannot vasodilate any further, they are stuck. Isoflurane is a known potent coronary vasodilator. Isoflurane induced coronary vasodilation will redistribute the blood flow away from these stuck vessels since they cannot vasodilate any more than they already are. Therefore, this redistribution of blood flow will create an increase in flow to normal tissue and a reduced flow to ischemic tissue. This is called coronary steel, since the vasodilation causes a steel effect away from the diseased tissue towards the normal tissue. This could be detrimental for the patient. Desferane is a fluorinated methyl ethyl ether. This volatile agent is derived from isoflurane by changing a single molecule, remove chloride from isoflurane and place this with fluoride, creating desferane. Desferane has a very pungent and irritating odor and should not be used for inhalational induction. This volatile agent has a low lipid solubility, somewhat like nitrous oxide, which allows for fast anesthesia onset and offset. The low potency of desferane means it must be used in much higher concentrations than any other volatile agents, which increases the cost. Like isoflurane, desferane may sensitize the myocardial musculature and epinephrine should be limited to 7 micrograms per kilo of patient weight if added to local anesthetic for regional block. Desferane may also cause coronary steel, although this is less likely than with isoflurane. Sevoflurane is the newest of the commonly used volatile agents, and sevoflurane is a fluorinated methyl isopropyl ether, again, a molecular change to an ether molecule. Sevo has a sweet smelling odor, which makes it almost ideal for inhalational induction. It does not irritate the bronchial tree and is therefore good for patients with reactive airways, for example, asthma patients. SIBO has a low lipid solubility that allows for a fast onset and offset of anesthesia, although with longer cases, probably more than a couple of hours, emergence appears to be equal to isoflurane. SIBO probably does not cause coronary steel. But SIBO does sensitize the myocardial muscle to the same effect as isoflurane, 
and therefore epinephrine should be limited to less than 5 micrograms per kilo of patient weight when added to local anesthetic for a regional block. Although rare, SIBO can cause seizure activity, especially with pediatric patients. This chart summarizes the pros and cons for the different gases we use in anesthesia. Despite many similarities, there are situations where it will be beneficial to select a specific agent or gas. The chart is in your notes, but a few things should be pointed out. The only gas with analgesic properties is nitrous oxide. This gas is also non-pungent and is often used during inhalational induction. Nitrous oxide does not trigger malignant hyperthermia. Biggest drawbacks with nitrous oxide are probably its tendency to enter closed spaces and cause nausea and vomiting. Isofluorine is the oldest and also the cheapest of the volatile agents. It is very reliable and easy to titrate to effect. Downsides are that it triggers malignant hyperthermia and has a pungent odor. Desferrin has a very rapid uptake and elimination, and therefore fast onset and offset of anesthesia. Downsides are that it is very irritable to the lungs, so it is not good for inhalation induction, and it also needs a special vaporizer that is heated and pressurized. Unfortunately, it is expensive and due to its low potency must be used in high concentrations. Like all volatile agents, it can cause malignant hyperthermia. Sevofluorine is excellent for inhalational induction due to being non-pungent. It is almost as expensive as desferrin and may cause malignant hyperthermia. To finish up this presentation of inhalational anesthetics, I will cover a few key points special for the PACU nurse. As always, vigilance is the key to recovering a patient after general anesthesia. It only takes a very short moment of not paying attention for a patient to suffer irreversible harm. A basic understanding of the effects caused by inhaled anesthetic agents will be most helpful during recovery. It is much easier to anticipate what can happen with a good understanding of the pharmacology of these gases. Monitor vital signs closely. All volatile agents have both cardiac and respiratory depressant effects. Preoperative vital signs are a good starting point when receiving the patient from the OR. Be observant of the entitled CO2 level in the obese and or patient with obstructive sleep apnea. Although the patient is awake when brought out from the OR, there is still volatile agents being released from the tissues. You can smell this on the patient's breath. With a long anesthetic, more than three to four hours, volatile agents will be released for an extended period of time due to an excessive absorption into the muscle and fat tissues. If nitrous oxide was used, you should allow for a minimum of 10 minutes with mask oxygen before attempting to have the patient on room air due to the risk of diffusion hypoxia. Temperature regulation may be depressed by general anesthesia. You should observe for both hypo and hyperthermia. Shivering is unpleasant and can significantly increase the oxygen consumption for the patient. Shivering is most often noted with pediatrics or if the core temperature is low, more than 2 degrees Celsius or 4 degrees Fahrenheit below the patient's normal core temperature. The most common drug treatment options are clonidine and meperidine, but don't forget about warm blankets or forced air heating devices. Surgery causes antidiuretic hormone ADH release. This is triggered by stress, pain, nausea, bleeding, various drugs given, and positive pressure ventilation by anesthesia. ADH causes sodium and water retention, which will decrease urinary output. 
This can last one to two days post-operative and may warrant small doses of diuretic. We hope you have enjoyed this second lecture in the series. We have created a seven lecture series covering many techniques used in anesthesia. We have specifically focused on the need of the PACURN and hope you will find time to view the other six lectures as well. The lecture series include this lecture, Inhalation Anesthesia, and the following six lectures, Basic Principles of Pharmacology, Non-Opioid Intravenous Anesthetics, Opioid Intravenous Anesthetics, Neuromuscular Blocking Agents, Local Anesthetics, and Regional Anesthesia. All lectures are available on the Palmetto Health intranet as well on stormanesthesia.com forward slash education forward slash PACU forward slash PACU videos.